This morning we're going to be reading the scripture from the book of Proverbs 8, uh, from verse 1 to verse number 11, and then we'll be skipping from uh, then to verse 32 to 36. Proverbs 8. Doesn't wisdom call out? Doesn't understanding make her voice heard? At the height, at the height, overlooking the road, at the crossroads, there she takes her stand. Beside the gates leading into the city, at the main entrance, she cries out, People, I call out to you. My cry is to the children of Adam. Learn to be shrewd. You who were inexperienced, develop common sense. You who are foolish, listen, for I speak of noble things. And what my lips say is right. For my mouth tells the truth and wickedness is detestable to my lips. All the ways of my mouth are righteous. None of them are deceptive or perverse. All of them are clear to the perceptive and right to those who discover knowledge. Accept my instructions instead of silver, and knowledge rather than pure gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and nothing desirable can equal it. Verse 32, and now sons, listen to me. Those who keep my ways are happy. Listen to, the instruct listen to instructions and be wise. Don't ignore it. Anyone who listens to me is happy, watching at my door every day, waiting by the spots, waiting by the post, by the post of my doorway. For the one who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But the one who misses me harms himself. All who hates me love death. That is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reino, and I have the privilege of leading this church as an elder uh, and pastor, and also to open up the word of God this morning and teach from it. I'm really excited about it. I want to ask you a question as we start this morning. The question is up on the screen. Have you, fill in the blank, deeper over the last 10 weeks? Have you known deeper? Have you understood deeper? Have you experienced Deeper. Have you listened? Deeper. Have you been transformed? Deeper. Have you seen deeper? Have you felt deeper? Have you read deeper? Have you loved deeper? Have you given deeper? Have you shared deeper? I ask you this because that is how we create space for transformation in our lives. Listen, create space for what? For transformation by the Holy Spirit in our lives. Transformation means changing, fam, from one thing into another. That's what the word trans means. It means growing, it means becoming, it means being formed. And not formed into something random, formed into the image of Christ. I'm asking you these questions because I want to ask you, is there space in your life for the Holy Spirit to work? That's what the series is all about, or at least has been about over the last 10 weeks. Let me put it to you straight. A faith that is not growing is dead. This stage that I'm on is dead. It's not growing. Not even a millimeter. Ever. It's done. But it's not a living organism. It's something that's dead. The grass outside in the square that you can't see now, but you will be able to see when you exit the door. Now that's something that's alive. Changes color, grows, bears fruit, 
needs cutting and mowing and pruning and nurturing. You either have a dead faith that's going absolutely nowhere, or you have a dynamic faith that's growing and yielding fruit. And through this series, we wanted to create space for you to fill in the blank and get it done deeper. So have you? Have you? We've been here for 10 weeks now. Have you? Fill in the blank. Deeper. Our teaching text this morning comes from Proverbs. Now, I need to show you a few slides on Proverbs, just to give you a quick overview. It's going to feel like a lot of pictures, okay? It's three slides filled with pictures, but just stay with me here for a second. Let's look at the first one. This is a really good summary of the book of Proverbs from the Bible Project. Proverbs is what? No, no, uh, just one back, please, and so Proverbs is what? A guide for living well in God's world. There you go. That's what the book is all about. Let me show you how the book is structured. And there's a few things that I want you to take note of. So firstly, if I can have the second slide, please. You'll see that chapters 1 to 9, which is where our teaching text comes from, is uh, an introduction to Proverbs. Okay? In two big sections in this first part is you find ten speeches from a father to a son. Very fitting for Father's Day. And then you've got four poems of Lady Wisdom. Okay? So that makes up the bulk of the first nine chapters. So ten speeches from father to son and four poems from Lady Wisdom. Okay, so let's zoom in on the four poems from Lady Wisdom quickly. So the four poems from Lady Wisdom you'll see in chapter 1, 3, 8, and 9. They all carry an invitation. Okay? And here's the invitation. Come and learn from me. Okay. And then Lady Wisdom makes claims as, as she teaches. She would claim that she's the one that enables kings to uphold justice. She would claim that she's the one that helps God's people live with integrity. She would claim that she's the one that stirs up generosity among people. And she would claim, check this, that we live in a moral universe. She would say, God created the universe in a specific way, and you need to get with the program and live according to how He created the universe. That's what Lady Wisdom says. Now, Lady Wisdom says, then you will uphold justice, you live with integrity, you'll be generous, and a whole bunch of other things as you work through the book of Proverbs. I think this is the formula that Lady Wisdom appeals to. Look at it with me. Fear of the Lord and wisdom equals living along the grain of the universe. Okay? So that's her invitation. Come and learn from me. How to live along the grain of this universe, the one that was made with moral laws in it. Okay? Now the chapter we read today is the second speech of woman wisdom, and it's structured as an introduction, that's verses 1 to 3. And then she has this long speech in three parts, verses 4 to 11, 12 to 21, 22 to 31. We're only going to focus on the first part of the speech. And then she has a conclusion, right, in verses 32 to 36. And uh, that's the last part of our teaching text. We have a specific focus for today, okay? The theme for today is speaking with wisdom. So let me just show you a slide quickly. This is courtesy of our own Josie Klopper and the material that she wrote for our course called The Deeper Journey. Okay? I won't be able, Josie, to exhaustively explain it, but just go with me. Yeah. So we've said all along in this journey, both the sermon series and our discipleship journey titled The Deeper Journey, that words come into our ears and eventually makes its way to our hearts. 
Okay? We've said that as a principle of living in the face of God and in a relationship with Jesus. Then we said, depending on what's going on in your heart, right? depending the, uh, on the condition of the soil of your heart, those words will become something. right? They will bear fruit. So if it falls in good soil, it'll bear fruit of life. If it falls in bad soil or hard soil, it'll bear fruit of death, but it will become something. And then we've said from the heart, as these words come into our ears and settles in our hearts, words also exit our mouths. And the words that exit our mouths come from the heart. And as these words come from the heart, they carry a massive power. And that is, they can cause life or death. And when we speak these words, they make their way all the way back into our ears. And we hear them as we speak them. Do you guys see the flow of words in our hearts, right? In our very being. So what we're going to focus on today, just keep that slide on for me now, and Silver, please, is we want our words to be wise. We want our words to bring life. We want our words to be good seeds that enter our ears and the ears of other people and actually bear good fruit. Let me give it to you straight. What we say matters a lot. And therefore, we need to speak with wisdom. Now, if you want to speak with wisdom, I think we need to ask four questions that the text will answer. Let me show you. So firstly, where can we find wisdom? We can have uh, the questions on, please, and so forth. Where can we find wisdom? Who is it for? How do we know we found it? And why does it matter? Let's pray. Father God, as we open your word now, we believe that it carries your words. And we believe that those words will now enter our ears and it will make its way to the soil of our hearts. And we believe that these very words are supposed to shape the words that come from our hearts and exit our mouths. We want to glorify you, Lord Jesus, in our speech. We want to accept the invitation of Lady Wisdom. We want to speak with wisdom so that our words can bear fruit and can bring life. We don't want our words, Father God, to break down what it is that you are currently doing in our lives. We don't want our words to influence life and life in abundance that you give us so freely through your kindness and your mercy. So, Holy Spirit, move among us now. Open up these words, illuminate it as we study them. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, let's look at the first one. Where can we find wisdom? I'll have the scripture on the screen. And as always, I made some bold and underlines for you so that you can see some words being emphasized. Let's look at the first three verses. It's actually straightforward. Call out and her voice, right? And then you see heights, crossroads, gates, and the main entrance. Where can we find wisdom? It's one person in four places. There you go, according to these three verses. It is a presence, and it is a presence where, it's a presence where life happens. Do you see it? So if you look at those words, heights, crossroads, gates, and main entrance, it says, wisdom is to be found, check, where people are protected, that's the heights, where people meet, that's the crossroads, and also where people work and trade, that's the gate and the entrance. Okay? So there's a presence to be found where life happens. And that presence is found in a person, and that person says, here where life happens, I will give you wisdom. Quick side note, listen to everything you guys shared during question of the day. It was all about moments in your life. All of us shared stories about people who are wise, and they're wise, why? Because they help me to love. And that's exactly what wisdom promises. It's there where you love, I'll find you. Okay, so how do you find it? You need to open your 
ears. Do you see it? Not your eyes, your ears. Because wisdom is speaking and wisdom is calling out. So you need to open your ears to wisdom as life happens and then start speaking accordingly. Has anyone ever seen a baby starting to speak? How does that happen? Repetition, 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 and then they catch on to it. Obviously, before I can say, Mama, I need to hear someone say, Mama. Before I can speak with wisdom as life happens, I need to hear wisdom speak to me in exactly the same way. And here's the amazing thing about this portion of Scripture. It's not hide and seek. It's listen and find. Do you guys remember the old game, Where's Wally? That's not how wisdom rolls. The game's name isn't Where's Wisdom? As if wisdom is hiding from me and I need to go and look for it. No, it's listen and find. Why? Because I'm calling out and I'm making my voice heard. It's there to be found. Now, this might sound abstract. And it might sound impersonal. It's not. I've got really good news for you. Let me show you the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. Here's what he says. Yet, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. There you go. So where's this wisdom in the Old Testament to be found now? It's to be found in the person of Jesus Christ. And then I love verse 25, because God's foolishness is wiser, wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And after that you have to read, as if God can be foolish, and as if God can be weak. Like Paul is taking the mickey here, saying, even if God would be able to be foolish, which he cannot still much wiser than you guys. And even though he might be able to be weak, which he can't be, he'll still be way stronger than you guys. But look, Jesus Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So it's still a person. It's still a presence in everyday life. In exactly the same way that uh, Proverbs chapter 8 describes it. Now, always and everywhere, yes. Look at it. Matthew, 18, uh, Matthew 28, verse 20. And remember, Mufasa voice, I am with you always to the end of the age. So let's just back up here. A presence with me always, where I live, speaking to me. Yes, that's Jesus Christ. Fam, this side of the resurrection, remember Proverbs is an Old Testament book, and after the Old Testament follows the New Testament, which tells the story of Jesus' perfect birth, life, death, the resurrection, ascension, and return. This side of the resurrection, it's the clearest it's ever been, where wisdom is, how to find wisdom, and who wisdom is. Okay? And because we saw Jesus' perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return, we have the perfect model of how to live with wisdom, which means we have the perfect model of how to speak with wisdom. Not only that, we have the words of Jesus Christ recorded in the Bible for us, and we have a personal, intimate relationship with Him, the one who is called wisdom. Do you know this? Do you experience this? Do you acknowledge this? Jesus became a human being, wrapped himself in flesh, died the death we should have died after living the life we should have lived to satisfy God's wrath, right, by payment through His blood, to reconcile us to the Father so that we can be in a relationship with Him so that we can intimately know wisdom. 
Like that's part of the good news. It's not only the forgiveness of sins. It's also the renewal and the redemption of yourself. And the restoration of uh, uh, who God created you to be. And one of those dimensions is to become wiser and to grow in wisdom. And not only to know wisdom, but also to know how to speak with wisdom. You are supposed to grow in this. Not because you're cool, but because Jesus made a way for you to grow in this. Like it's there for the taking. There's a saying, I often hear people use it in the US, I don't know if we use it over here. But the saying goes, it's put on the bottom shelf. Meaning it's easy to reach. Wisdom isn't something that is only exclusive to clever people. It's on the bottom shelf for all of us. Because wisdom is to be found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you, sorry, if Jesus is your Lord, you can speak with wisdom. Why? Because you know where to find it. And you find it in Him and in your relationship with Him. That's great news, fam. You look really depressed, but it's great news. So where can we find wisdom? First one. Second one, who is it for? Let's look at verses 4 to 7. Wisdom describes her audience, and she says, everyone, even fools. No limits are put upon the audience of wisdom. The address, check, is to anyone who is ready to listen. Are you ready to listen? Because if you are, it's for you. You can be as foolish and incompetent and incomplete and ignorant as you are. If you're ready to listen, it's for you. Children of Adam. You had a funky pronunciation. You said Adam, which I like. Verse 5 is a command. It's not a suggestion. And the tone of the speech of Lady Wisdom, as we continue, remains a commanding one. It's not a casual coffee in which Wisdom says, you might want to consider these things. No, no, no. Wisdom says, listen, learn, develop, and listen. It's a command. I want to ask you a question. What do you do when you receive a command or an instruction? Have you ever heard, I don't like to be told what to do? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard parents say about their kids, look, he or she does not like to be told what to do. I would like to put it to you, that you don't have a choice when it comes to wisdom. Period. So whether you like it or not, if you want to be wise, you will be told what to do. And maybe that's something that you need to consider and grow in. Because it's funny when we tell those stories, I do not like to be told what to do. My question is, if that filters through to your relationship with Jesus, how will you ever gain wisdom? How will you ever gain wisdom if you don't like instruction? Because wisdom gives instruction. And that comes back to our soil question. And that is how ready and how receptive are our hearts to receive this seed. Because if your posture is, I do not like to be told what to do, then your heart is not receptive and it's not ready. I, I read this uh, proverb in Hebrew. Whee! It's difficult. So I think this translation, verse 5 and 6, well, verse 5, it's, it's a good translation. Here's a different translation, if you want to translate it like directly from Hebrew. It says, you simple ones, learn insight. You fools, learn understanding. That's what it says. And in Hebrew, it uses the word heart. It just, it can't be translated into English. So the best way that I can translate it is, have a heart that's ready for insight and understanding. That's what it says. 
So what does the soil of your heart look like? We've asked that question all through the sermon series and the course. Look at verse 6. It's a command again. And it says, listen. And then it says, what wisdom speaks of. Noble, right, and truth. And it says that wickedness is detestable to the lips of wisdom. Fam, truth, listen to me. Jesus won't mislead us. He speaks things that are noble, that is right, and that is the truth. And He cannot speak things that is wicked. Sometimes, when Christians look for wisdom, we pretend as if Jesus is giving us these ambiguous answers. He can't. If you are experiencing His leading as something that might carry a swath of wickedness, that's not Him speaking. Because He can't. It goes against the character of God as our Father. We can't pretend like He's sending us mixed messages. Wickedness cannot be in His mouth. And it cannot exit His lips. So nothing that you ever ask wisdom for will have an answer that is consistent with sin and wickedness. It simply cannot be that way. That's what the Bible says. So where can we find it? Who is it for? We've answered both of those questions. It's to be found in Jesus. And it's for anyone who's keen to listen. Let's look at the third one. How do we know we've found it? Okay? So, I mean, obviously, I'm putting it to you now that you can speak with wisdom and that wisdom is to be found. Awesome, but I know I'm in it. How, how do I know? Here's how you know. Let's look at verse 8 to verse 11. We are going to go slow. And we're going to go deep. Looking at all of these highlighted words. Especially the words in verses 8 to 9. Why? Because this is how wisdom speaks. So if we speak with wisdom, we speak the same. Do you see it? So there's your answer. The answer to how do I know if I found it is I will speak like this. Let's take a look. Righteous. The words from my mouth are righteous. The easiest way to explain what the word righteous means, means or, or is when everything and everyone is in right relationship with one another, which includes transcendent relationships like our relationship with God. Question. When you speak, does that bring people closer to one another? Or does it create distance between people? When you speak, does it bring you closer to others? Or does it create distance between you and others? When you speak, does it bring you closer to God? Or does it create distance between you and God? That's a rough one. But, if you speak with wisdom, you'll speak words that bring you and others, you and God, others and others and others and God, and you and others in God, closer to one another. What a test. What a filter. Let's keep going. None of them are deceptive or perverse. How do you Share a story. How do you tell a story about other people? How do you speak of others? Because if it's deceptive, you're not speaking with wisdom. If you're creating spin, if you're adding your own little emotional sources to the facts, or if you are being economic with the truth, and not saying everything. Or if you're describing something that you felt that you didn't see, you are deceiving.
I listened to a podcast once. I actually do listen to a lot of podcasts, just if you were wondering. And here's what the guy said, and I had to pause. I had to pause after that podcast and take a breather. He said, how someone speaks of someone else in front of you is how they also speak of you in front of other people. And I was like, okay, pause, take a break, prostrate position, tear clothes, sackcloth and ashes on the head, Lord Jesus, please have mercy on me, a sinner. But have you ever picked that up? Like if someone rinses their mouth about someone else in front of you, I promise you they do exactly the same thing with you in front of someone else. We cannot be those people. It's deceptive. Perverse. If the words of our mouth are perverse, here's what we do. We talk about something from a place of your own lustful desires. That's what perverse speak is. Is I look at something or I experience something or I say something, but I say it because I lust after something myself and then I pull that thing or that person or that situation into my own emotion and conversation. Do you see it? We shouldn't do it. It shouldn't be in our speech. Look at verse 9. All of them, that's words of wisdom, are clear to the perceptive and right to those who discover knowledge. Now, clear to the perceptive indicates a knowledge that is deeper than only your head. Have you guys ever heard the, 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 the phrase, you know, I just felt it in my gut. You thought it, yeah, but you felt it, yeah. Good stuff. We one human being, you know. So the clarity that this verse is talking about is more than only knowing it in my head. Right? But it is a clarity that entails, and I think these are important words, you measuring and weighing and applying your mind. You have to think and measure, uh, not measure, measure. <laughs> think and measure and weigh. You have to apply your mind and you have to discern here what is right. And wisdom says that all of the words that he, she speaks are words that were measured, uh, measured, 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 weighed, discerned, and then spoken with clarity. So when we speak this way, it means that we've measured our words, we know what's right, and then we speak it. Question, what are your words like? A uh, quick and important side road here, uh, just verse 10. Let's have a look at verse 10 quickly. Verse 10 is a command. Okay, look at the command. The command says, except. And it says, instead of and rather than. Okay? Why is it a command? Because most would probably settle for silver and gold. Like if I can get silver and gold, I'll take it. So I'll treat wisdom as a side issue. Wisdom says in this proverb, that you should not let money dictate your actions. Do you see it? When I saw it this week, I was like, what a profound discovery. Don't let money guide all your decisions and all your words. Now, I can't double click it now, I'm running out of time. But I think that's something that we should have a discussion on later, or that we should at least uh, uh, um, consider as a question worth asking. Wisdom says, if you make decisions, you make it according to what is noble, right, truth, and righteous. You don't make it according to the money. If any of you just heard the words, why do I live this way? Must be the money. Anyone? Okay, I'm really old. But those are the words from Nelly that I just heard in my head. And then verse 11 is a comparison. It says, better than. Do you believe that wisdom is better than jewels? 
Do you believe that wisdom is better and that nothing else uh, that is desirable can equal it? We've spoken about where we can find it. We've spoken about who, is it, who it's for. We've spoken about how do we know if we found it. Let's land the plane here. Why does it matter? Okay. Verse 36 carries the answer. And it's actually really, really easy. Because you'll harm yourself and you will love death. There you go. How's that for a mission statement? I am going to spend my days harming myself and loving death. Wisdom says, if you ignore her, him, then that's what's going to happen. So if I state it like this, right? Who wants to harm themselves and love death? No one will say, sign me up. But if we ignore wisdom, that's what will happen to us. Why does this matter? Well, look at the highlights. Happy, happy, finds and obtains. Who doesn't want to be happy, fam? Who gets up in the morning and goes, I am so excited to have a horrible day. It's going to be a howler. I'm going to struggle from start to finish. I can't wait. None of us wake up like that. You wake up going, I want to feel happy and blessed and experience the abundance that God has given for us. There you go. That's what you'll find. You'll find life and you'll obtain favor from the Lord. That's why it matters. But how is important. Look at the words. Listen, keep, listen, listens, watching and waiting. That is how we get it. Wisdom has spoken far and wide right, in this proverb, about her mission and her origins. And she just said in the portion we didn't read that she really loves human beings. She says, I delight in human beings and I love giving them wisdom because God created the world to be a world filled with wisdom. And now, like the teacher in the earlier chapters, she returns to her audience of verse 4 and she concludes exhorting them to listen. Listen. Learn, speak, repeat. That's how we speak with wisdom. Listen, learn, speak, repeat. Now fam, your words can bring you closer to this, right? Happy, happy, finds and obtains. Or your words can move you away from it. Harm yourself and love death. And these are one of the, this is one of those situations where there's no neutral. It's life and death, and they are set up as two things that can't coexist. It's either or. Now we need Jesus to do this. And we should be real in acknowledging that we need Him, His grace, His mercy, and the leading of His Holy Spirit. Personally, for me, if I can open up my curtains and put my stuff out before you, this is probably the biggest growth point for me as a disciple of Jesus. And not over the past week. It's been a growth point for years. And I'm still growing in it. Not only because I've been given a platform to actually speak words, but also because I like speaking. And I don't always think about what I say. And then I harm myself and I love death. Ugh, such a sobering portion of Scripture. But I need you to at least be able to pinpoint where you are at at the moment when it comes to your own words. Okay, so I'm going to give it time for us to respond. Let me show you one last portion of Scripture. It comes from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. And this is James, also a book of wisdom in the New Testament. And here's what he says. With the tongue... We bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. He says, blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. We don't actually need anything more than that as an exhortation. That's what the Bible says. This is a Bible preaching and Bible believing church. So that's what we ought to do. 
And then he says, Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. James is saying this with our end goal in mind. And that's really important. The book of James doesn't just say, tame your tongue. It says, God is completing you. And He wants to completely complete you. <laughs> and one of the ways in which He will completely complete you <laughs> is by taming your tongue. So that you can become wise with your words. God is doing a great work in us. And He's busy completely completing us. And if He wants to work on your mouth and on your words that you should speak with wisdom, then we should follow His leading there. Back to the question in the beginning. I asked you, did you fill in the blank deeper? There is listening deeper. And there is experiencing deeper. And I think that's the context for us for putting these words into practice. Is to say, okay, I'm going to listen deeper and I'm going to experience wisdom deeper. We're going to respond by using our words first to bless the Lord. And as we use our words to bless the Lord, we are going to trust Him to complete this work in us. So let me pray for us. Please keep playing. Let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll respond in song. Father God, we want you to complete, to completely complete us. We want you to grow us and to shape us and to mold us. And we want you to do it through this scripture and through this teaching about our words. Lord Jesus, we need your grace. We need your guidance. We need your leading. We need your words. I pray that you would meet us in this place of need. And that you would empower us and that you would help us. To be able to speak with wisdom. Thank you that you are our power. And that you are our wisdom. For that, Father God, we bless you. Accept our praises now with our mouths that are also holy and set aside to proclaim your words. We pray that in your name. Amen.